I think that we can we can start we can start the meeting. Uh, good evening, dear minister, dear ambassador, dear students. I am so happy that it is possible for us to meet uh, at, at, at the evening uh, to, to discuss very important issues. Everybody knows that today energy crisis uh, is uh, everywhere um, discussed, uh, not only in academia, uh, but also in uh, political circles at the European Union level uh, we know that energy energy ministers eu energy ministers meet uh, almost three times in months uh, at extraordinary meetings so energy crisis energy security is a topic on the top agenda in europe not only in europe that is why we decided to invite you to come today and to listen to our honorary guest to whom we are very grateful that he um, agreed uh, and accepted uh, our invitation, uh, Minister Yaroslav Demchenko, Deputy Minister of Energy of Ukraine. And uh, lessons uh, which we, in the European Union, we can, uh, we can take uh, from this, uh, how to say from this situation, I, which was created not only by the war, but uh, mainly by the energy blackmailing uh, Europe uh, by Russian Federation. I think that these lessons should stay with us. And uh, on the basis of these lessons, we, we will take, and uh, many of them can be taught uh, by Ukraine uh, to European Union. And these lessons will create the base for creating a real energy energy policy within uh, the European Union. So I would like to, to, to say that it is so important to discuss, it is so important to be au courant with what is going on in this field. That is why, as I said, I am so grateful once again to Minister uh, for, your, for your time, uh, for your willingness to meet with our students at the College of Europe in Atolin to discuss it. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for, for this. Minister Demchenkov uh, is, as I said, Deputy Minister of Energy in Ukraine since 2020, but is in, has been involved in the sector for many years. Uh, he was working in the, um, in the projects uh, organized by the international organizations. He was very active also in the political life in Ukraine uh, for, for, for many years. Um, so we can talk not only with the person who is responsible for the answer from Ukraine to this crisis, but also a person who is knowledgeable uh, and well experienced in, in the field. Minister Demchenko is uh, responsible uh, within his Ministry for European Integration uh, for a coordination of, uh, of the work uh, on energy within the Ukrainian administration, but also for a coordination of um, external relations of Ukraine in energy field. So we will have a a possibility to talk with the right person on this uh, topic. Uh, today's, um, today's meeting will be moderated by Ambassador Artur Lorkowski, Director of Energy Community Secretariat in Vienna. So uh, one of the best, uh, uh, one of the best experts in Europe also on um, energy policy. So uh, today evening uh, seems to be a very um, good opportunity for us to learn a lot and to discuss. So I would like to um, uh, encourage everybody not only to listen, but to be active in the second part of today's meeting I mean question and answers. Mr. Minister, if I may, you to take the floor and after Ambassador Lorkowski will moderate the discussion. Thank you very much and we will start with Minister. Minister, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Excellencies. Uh, thank you for your 
uh, invitation. Thank you for inviting me to speak uh, here today. Uh, I congratulate students of the College of Europe in Natalin as you come back to university. Thank you for the organizers uh, for asking me to give a lecture on energy resilience in the time of war. It is hard to overestimate the importance of this topic, especially now with just two and a half months left uh, until the winter comes. Three days ago, the Russians entered uh, uh, Russian troops identified missile shelling of the civilian infrastructure of Ukraine, trying to leave its uh, peaceful cities without uh, power. They are trying to make people unable to cook food, switch on a heater, read some news. And this is very typical for Russia, whose army is used uh, to fighting civilians. The world saw it in Georgia. It observed such actions for years in Syria, and now it is happening in Ukraine for over 200 days and counting. This is Russia's war on the civilized world, and it repair Cations are left globally. From the increase of the gasoline and electricity prices in EU countries due to the fact that Russia uses energy as a weapon, to the increase in the prices of bread in the Middle East due to the fact that Russia blocks the export of Ukrainian grain. In hitting peaceful cities with missiles, Russia is acting as a terroristic state. Having occupied Europe's largest nuclear power plant, the Zaporizhia NPP, and threatening the world with a catastrophe, Russia is behaving like a nuclear terrorist. In blocking shipments of Ukrainian grain, Russia is behaving like a food terrorist. And finally, in block mailing Europe with cutting off gas and oil, Russia is behaving like an energy terrorist. Therefore, when talking about energy resilience in the time of war today, we cannot leave out the broad context of this situation. We should be oriented on broad context of this situation. The way we have got to the point where one state's act of terror impact the whole world. Thus, in my lecture, I will start with the underlining <coughs> causes of the situation and then move on those conclusions in the field of energy that can and shown draw. Underlining cause one, crisis of international institutions. I recently spoke at an event held by a respected international organization. Since 2014, since the beginning of the Russian aggression in Ukraine, this organization had been engaged in monitoring of the conflict line, sent its representative there, made reports, but its eight year of work ended not with the resolution of the crisis, but with its deepening. Of course, this is not the fault of this particular organization. It has just turned out that international law only works when all parties abide by it. Today, after 202 days of full-scale war in Ukraine, we see the paralysis of key international institutions. Prisoners of war 
been torched, rapes, mass murdered, seizure of nuclear fac uh, facilities. It turns out that a terrorist state can do anything if the international community has only deep concern as its sole means of influence. In primarily impunity that works as an indulgement for war criminals. As long as this feeling of impunity is possible, humanity will be horrified by the crimes being committed in Aleppo, Mariupol, Bucha, Irpeng. Evidently, the international system that was built after the Second World War in order to make the Third World War impossible requires modernization. The world has changed in 70 years. So international institutions need to change as well. An example can be shown. I can call it uh, otherwise regarding the issue of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine at the UN Security Council. When the one who has to answer sits at the table and decades the rules of the game. While the presence of Russia in the international organization is sitting and still significant, this is blocks the full fledged work of these organizations. Recently, the International Atomic Energy Agency mission published a report, but did not say the main thing that Zaporizhia plant is occupied by Russia, that the threat to nuclear security came from Russia, and that the deoccupation, demilitarization, and return of the Parisian plan under the control of Ukraine is the only way to ensure nuclear safety. This is understood by all members of the UN Security Council. Unfortunately, not Russia, but unfortunately, the IAEA does not say it. Underlining calls to illusions. It cannot be said that Russia's aggression caught the civilized world by surprise. To be more precise, it did not catch the world by surprise precisely because for a long time, some leaders wanted to ignore threatening signals and conduct businesses as usual with Russia. It was not because they believed it would work, rather they did so because it was convenient. In 2008, Russia attacked Georgia, testing the response of the international community. The international community responded by allowing Russia to be in constructing of the Nord Stream 1 gas pipeline in 2010. In 2040, Russia annexed Crimea and occupied parts of the Ukrainian Donbass. With the same goal in mind, the world responded with half-hearted sanctions on the one hand, and the start of construction of the Nord Stream 2 on the other. The Ukrainian side, including my colleagues from the energy sector, spent a lot of efforts convincing European politicians that the Nord Streams were not an economic, but a geopolitical projects of Russia. However, the cheap gas illusion 
was more powerful than thousands of deaths in the Ukrainian Donbas and Georgia. On February 21st of this year, all our warnings turned out to have been true. It has become critical, clear that Russia has only one economy and it's oriented not on improving the lives of its citizens, but on beefing up its military. And there are no purely economic goals. These are imperialistic goals that can be dressed in loan, cheap gas, and quasi-infrastructure projects like the Nord Streams. Threat from Russia. Today, the multi-level threat from Russia has become obvious to almost everyone. Even to those governments that flirted with Russia in the past and hoped to keep separate their political and economic components in relations with the Kremlin. I call this threat multi-level since it is not limited to Ukraine. The Kremlin propagandists like to claim that in Ukraine, they are fighting their collective West. Collective West, they call this. It is more comfortable for them to believe that they are being beaten by the mythical NATO troops and not by the Ukrainian soldiers, most of whom until recently worked in offices, in industrial enterprises and farms. Actually, it is the opposite in Ukraine. Russia is fighting the West. It is fighting the Western values and principles. It is fighting democracy and freedom. Just in February of this year, Freedom House, a watchdog, published a report saying that autocracy is making progress in the struggle against democracy, that authoritarian leaders are working together to consolidate power and increase an attack on democracy and human rights. And literally right after this report was released, autocratic Russia began a full-scale war in Ukraine. This resulted in massive civilian casualties, war crimes, and destruction of critical infrastructure. Russians' goals is to spread the pandemic of authoritarianism and global instability. To achieve this goal, Russia employs various weapons, various weapons missiles and bombs, venal journalists and politicians, gas and oil, energy and nuclear blackmail. All these make up the multi-level threat from Russia. And this, then that's why Russia and its satellites pose a threat to all of humanity today. Three chief conclusions we must draw for the future. The aggressor cannot be stopped by concessions or concerns. It can be stopped only with a show of force. Hitler understood the language, this language alone. Putin and other dictators understand only this language today, the language of force. With attacks on Georgia and Ukraine, Putin warned others of these intentions. But many politicians wanted to believe in the illusion of cheap energy and doing business with Russians based on civilized practices. Today, Europe is paying for this knowledge with rising price and Ukraine, Ukraine with tens of thousands of lives. And the last conclusion, the existence of Imperial Russia 
poses a multi-level threat to global security today. This includes also energy industry, energy resilience. The ongoing uh, war in Europe became possible precisely because Europe relied too much on the principle of business as usual in energy matters. Meanwhile, for Russia, it was no business at all, but rather a long-term strategy aimed at destroying the democratic world. This is the Russian way. It uses energy resources to finance its imperialistic wars. And it uses wars to blackmail the world with energy resources. After all, its entire imperial doctrine, its entire aggression was based on the fanatical belief that Europe would not find the stress and determination to turn away from Russian oil and gas. Before the war, Ukraine began developing our energy strategy till 2015. And it, uh, uh, in, it, in this document, we declared our intention to get as close as possible to climate neutrality through phasing out fossil fuels and developing renewable energy sources and nuclear generation. We focused on reducing the use of coal, oil, and gas. And in 2021, we share a carbon neutral electricity in the national energy mix. And it was more than 70% as compared to an average of 63% in the EU at that time. The war has shown we were right. Even today, despite the war, our energy sector operates in a stable matter and demonstrates quite good resilience. Ukraine's critical infrastructure and its energy sector in particular become priority targets for the Russian forces from the beginning of the war. Actually, the war itself began a few hours after Ukraine's electricity grid disconnected from the power system of Russia and Belarus and went into an isolated mode of operation. For your information, Ukraine electricity grid were connected with Russia and Belarus grids from Soviet times, and we were quite dependent on Russian electricity in time when we needed to balance our system. The less uh, successful the Russians were in the battles, the more massive their strikes on civilian objects became. The five million Ukrainians have been without access to electricity in the last six months. This is about three Warsaw population-wise. However, just a few days ago, after Russian missile shelling, we have plus more than 5 million Ukrainians without access to electricity. Following devastating defeat at the battlefield, battlefield Russians decided to attack the, the civilian objects of the energy infrastructure. Russians completely switch over the Parisia and uh, NPP. Russians launched 12 rockets that targeted transmission systems and substations. Only three of them reached the target. But nevertheless, significant number of people left without electricity in Kharkivska, Sumska, Poltavska, Dnipropetrovska Oblast. Russians also severely damaged one of the biggest thermal power plants in Ukraine, Zmiivska. 
thus making the next heating season in Kharkiv one of the biggest city in Ukraine even more challenging. These objects are a purely civilian nature. Besides, we have been recently shocked by information that Russian railway received an order to draft 2,000 troops. Russian railway received an order to draft 2,000 troops. And the report of Bulgarian journalist, Mr. Grozev, says that Putin has ordered each government corporation and other oligarchs are told to set up their own private military companies for new stage of aggression in Ukraine in October. So Gazprom, Rosneft, other company with private military companies. This is beyond any imagination. As of September, 30% of thermal generation, more than 40% of solar generation, and 90% of wind generation in our Ukraine, in our country, were destroyed or taken over by the Russians. Thus, the actual destruction level is higher. We do not have the ability to pro protect all uh, transmission lines thermal power plants and substations. However, the professionalism and heroism of our energy industry workers as, help, uh, uh, as well as uh, the help of our partners allow us to restore the damages infrastructure as quickly as possible. And I want to use this opportunity to thank Artur Larkovsky the director of the energy community secretariat, who is present here for the secretariats and his personal efforts to help the Ukrainian energy sector for the equipment that Ukraine has already received and for the very initiative of the Energy Infrastructure Restruction, uh, Reconstruction Fund. I also want to thank Poland for the extra ordinary support that Ukraine has felt since the beginning of the war, both at the official and private levels. And uh, I am sure we will have a lot of joint projects after the war. This is really will be good uh, to have more close cooperation with uh, our Polish uh, colleagues. The war alters our plans. But the general line, which is uh, phasing out fossil fuels as fast as possible, remains unchanged. Moreover, phasing out hydrocarbons, which until uh, February 24 of this year had an uh, exclusively environmental dimension, has now become a key energy security issue. And not only for Ukraine, but for the entire civilized world. The Russian aggression in Ukraine, top of the Kremlin, uh, to the top of the Kremlin's mask. And everyone saw the obvious Russian energy resources are a weapon that the authoritarian regime uses against the European values and principles against democracy and freedom. But Russia is also fighting against climate neutrality and a sustainable future as such. The whole economy of modern Russia is driven by hydrocarbons. For the Kremlin, every step in the direction of climate neutrality is a nail in the coffin. That is why Russia will always oppose any shift to sustainable energy as long as the Putin regime remains in power. And Russia will especially try to use its leverage now on the eve of the winter season, hoping that higher energy bills and lower temperatures in homes 
will shift public attitudes in Europe and the EU leaders will have to agree to Russian energy blackmail. This situation clearly shows that a carbon-free fu future and sustainable energy is the only possible way forward to make sure that energy is not used as a weapon and human development does not pose a threat to the environment. Europe's rushed phase out of Russian energy resources will not be easy. The Kremlin octopus has spent far too much time entangling the content with the tankles of its oil and gas pipelines. But in order to better understand the difference in the price of such face out for Ukraine and for the EU, I will allow myself to quote Volodymyr Zelensky's word to Russians. This is word of our president to Russians, said last, uh, uh, I think a few days ago, uh, late on Sunday night, when the Russians struck against energy facility with uh, massive missiles uh, uh, barrage. So president said, even through the sick darkness, Ukraine and the civilized world clearly see these terrorist acts. Deliberate and cynical missile strikes on critical civilian infrastructure. Do you think that you can scare us, break us, make us consensions? You really did not understand anything. Don't understand who we are. What are we for? What are we talking about? Read my lips. Without gas or without you, without you. Without light or without you, without you. Without water or without you, without you. Without food or without you, without you. Cold, hunger, darkness, and sorrow are not as scary and deadly for us as your friendship and brotherhood, and of the president's quote. And I am sure that cold, hunger, darkness, and thought are not as scary for Europe as Russian energy resources and dependence on Russian energy. As uh, stealthing Russia's gas, as bloody Russian oil, as destruction of the very foundations of the European civilization. It will be a hard winter for us all, but at the same time, it will be the last winter of Russian energy blackmail. Despite strikes and destruction, we are already thinking about what to do next, about the future stability of the energy system of Ukraine, which has become part of the United Energy System of Europe. Ukraine is focused on phasing out coal and decreasing the usage of gas. Even now, we are planning our recovery as a sustainable and green system. And we are planning to boost the role of renewables, invest in energy efficiency and foster digital innovations. Our recovery will march the overall push for decarbonization. Our plan is not to restore Ukraine's energy industry as it was before the war, but to build a sustainable industry fit for the 21st century. This means our energy mix will be growing even less dependence on fossil fuels and even cleaner. It also means that we will limit any options for the energy weaponization. The Irish energy ministry once said that 
no one has ever weaponized access to the sun. No one has ever weaponized the wind. Perhaps a move to clean energy will be the greatest peace plan the world has ever known. And finally, my conclusions. This crisis we are experienced today is not the first and its kind uh, in the history of humanity. It's really difficult and tough time. We are appalled uh, by the fact that crimes such as those committed by the Russians have turned out to be still possible in the 21st uh, century. Previous crises were overcome through solidarity and this will too. But it will not be a solidarity of deep concerns, rather it will be a solidarity under which partners provide each other with weapons and necessary equipment, support each other at the levels of diplomacy and energy security. The international institutions which today are unable to deal with Russian terrorism were also created on the principle of solidarity. It is just uh, that over 70 years uh, this principle imperceptibly disappeared, giving way to an empty uh, uh, procedures. Russia's policy is aimed at uh, destroying the unity of the world, at its uh, fragmentation. After all, it is easy to break a signal. Uh, 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 it is it is easy to break a single nation, that a community of uh, like-minded countries. When we are together, we are. We have power. It is easy to break a single nation. We meanwhile believe that security for all means security for everyone. Uh, this extends, uh, extends to the energy industry as well. That is why Ukraine is ready to supply its electricity to the European energy system in order to reduce the needs for Russian gas, even in this difficult period of time for our energy sector. That is why we are ready to provide half of our own gas storage space to create a European gas reserve. That is why we decided to deliver 100,000 tons of coal to Poland, which now needs it. EU sanctions on Russian coal and oil are about solidarity. The Repower EU plan is about solidarity as well. We maintain its energy security. Uh, uh, the civilized world has no choice but to completely phase out Russian energy resources just only to completely phase out Russian energy security. This is just only one way to increase the level of energy security in our region. This consolidated position will be undermined Russians war making capacity more than any other actions. Thank you one again for your solidarity and for Give me opportunity to share with you these ideas. Thank you very much, Minister Demchenko of Yaroslav, for uh, for your lecture um, and this very unique opportunity to listen to your experience, uh, how the energy policy or your take on how the energy policy has been ran before the war in Ukraine, but also why the Russian energy policy led to the weaponization of, uh, of energy sources 
um, in the relations with uh, the European Union. But also what was extremely important for me uh, is to hear um, how Ukraine is thinking about the rebuilding process and the reconstruction process, what are the key principles in this regard, uh, as well as uh, uh, I think it is ex extremely important to, to, to know and recognize the fact that calling for solidarity for Ukraine means not only to, to be a solidarity receiver, but also solidarity provider, what you have uh, very clearly stated uh, when you express the willingness of Ukraine to share with the uh, energy resources with the European Union amid the war. So thank you very much again for, for this very um, comprehensive lecture, uh, giving us you know, insight in the Ukrainian, not only poly energy policy considerations, but also um, some reflections on more geopolitical uh, level. Okay, okay. Uh, the minister, I, I would like to express um, the gratitude of the Natalin community towards you for your readiness, your time, and uh, you, you, you know, your professional uh, contribution to the uh, to the the lecture today. I think it was a great opportunity for all of us to listen, you know, on not only where Ukrainian is in uh, in terms of war, how you are working together with your colleagues from the companies to ensure the resilience of, of, of the energy sector, how you are providing electricity, gas, heat to, to your citizens. But also, I think that was very important for me to, to listen about the future uh, on that, what will happen after the war will cease and after, after the victory of Ukraine, what I think it's a um, dream of not all of Ukrainians, but also of the, uh, the, the, the whole European uh, community. So I would like to thank you very much for, for this contribution. I would like to thank you very much for your time again. And uh, I think it will be on behalf of the whole Natolian community also. We wish uh, all the best and we wish you the victory and we wish you this uh, kind of very positive attitude towards future, unless the circumstances of today are very severe. And uh, we all know that the very tough time is ahead of us. And I, I think that the, you, you, your attitude to the solidarity is something which gives the hope that we can uh, survive. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that we will be celebrating the, uh, the victory of Ukraine uh, sooner than we, than, than we expect. So uh, once again, Jarosław, thank you very much. And uh, a big applause from, from the, from, from the audience here. I hope you hear it. Thank you, friend. Thank you so much. Yeah. So thank you very much for all of you for joining this first event of the Energy and Climate Ness at the College of Europe here in Natalie. So we'll be continue during the whole academic year with other events which have been presented yesterday to those who are more interested in, in, in following the activities. And uh, for today, I would like also thank you for active participation and uh, let's have a beautiful year ahead of us and i hope will be you'll be enjoying that uh, that cooperation with the energy and climate nest thank you very much